Ellie Warren was born in 1996 in Melbourne, Australia. She was the daughter of Paul Warren and Nicole Caffarella. According to friends and family, Ellie was a cheerful, intelligent, energetic woman who fought for what she believed in, having a strong personality. As a child, she attended Parkdale Secondary, and her greatest desire was to travel the world. Ellie wanted to work in several countries to experience the cultural and environmental differences of each one. This desire arose after she went to visit Kenya with her family as a teenager, which made her acquire a great passion for the country and the African continent. She always praised the region. According to her, Africa was a spectacular, both in its culture and its nature and people. She also described the trip as an incredible experience and said she was delighted with the opportunity to be in contact with the fauna and flora of the region. Africa has one of the greatest diversity of animals and plants in the world, and for Ellie, this was amazing, as she was fascinated by biology. In 2016, Ellie got the chance to repeat the much-loved experience. For all this feeling that she nurtured and expressed for the continent, she was invited to participate for six weeks in Africa Underwater, a voluntary marine life conservation program that would take place at Praia Tofo, located in southeastern Mozambique. It was the perfect opportunity to combine studies with personal desire. She was 20 years old and a biology student in Australia, focusing precisely on marine life. Ellie saw the opportunity as a lever to make her dream come true and immediately accepted it. Upon arriving in Mozambique, she stayed at a backpacker hostel on the seashore. The young woman declared to friends and family that the country was wonderful and that the place where she was specifically was like paradise on earth. She repeated that she loved the culture, the people, and above all, the nature of the place countless times. Ellie was completely fascinated by the trip. On her Facebook, she published several photos in different parts of the country, always with beautiful landscapes in the background or in contact with the animals of the local fauna. Her last photo published on the social network was on October 16, 2016. Everything on the trip went well and as expected. The weeks passed and Ellie seemed more and more happy to be part of the experience. On November 9, 2016, at around 5 a.m., a body was found by a fisherman behind a public toilet block. He immediately informed the police. The body was that of a white woman. She was on her stomach and her underwear was around her ankles. That body belonged to Ellie Warren. The day before, a Tuesday, Ellie had gone out with some friends to celebrate the end of the six-week volunteer program she had been participating in. She would return home in a few days, having completed the entire itinerary stipulated for the trip. Police began investigations and recognized the body as that of Ellie Warren. The autopsy report was extremely short and lacked important details. According to this report, Ellie has suffered an overdose from excessive drug consumption. The report also said there were no signs of violence or abuse, a hypothesis that had been raised early on by those following the case. And then the question arises, why was the case being so poorly investigated? The police chief responsible for an investigation confirmed that there was no evidence of abuse or other violence and that the death was indeed the result of an overdose. He also said that there was not a single scratch on the girl's body. To outsiders, the police seemed more concerned with the negative repercussions of the case than with the investigation of the crime. In interviews, you could see how the authorities said that the city's security was impeccable and that there was nothing to worry about. According to them, Ellie Warren's case was accidental and not criminal. The case was then quickly closed, being ruled out, but not for Ellie's family. Regarding what was said by the police, Ellie's family was not convinced by the findings. The autopsy result raised more doubts than certainties, as it had confusing information and the police report also did not detail the case with good precision. The family, not satisfied with this report, decided to seek the opinion of other authorities who were not directly involved in the case. The first question was about the toxicological results. Doctors in South Africa and Australia were then analyzed who reported that there were no drugs in Ellie's system. This, in itself, already indicated an error in the police investigation in Mozambique and broke the entire line drawn. But that was not all. 
Later analysis also stated that the real reason for Ella's death was asphyxiation from a large amount of sucked in sand. That diagnosis was given after experts found a huge amount of sand in her respiratory system. It could also be seen that she had several cuts and injuries on her neck and mouth, quite different from what the police announced, as you have already noticed. Experts said there was no chance the death could have been accidental. All the evidence, in fact, pointed to a cruel murder, which would have taken place on the beach, and only later was the body taken to the back of the public bathroom. After so many contradictions between information from the police and experts elsewhere, Ellie's family pressed for two years, the Mozambican authorities for better answers and a more thorough investigation. However, during this time, they received no satisfactory response. It was two years of inconsistent reporting and information obfuscated by the local police. Such behavior gave the impression that they were not taking the case as seriously as they should have, or worse, that they might be protecting the person responsible or those responsible for the crime against Ellie. From that point on, extremely frustrated with the way things were going, Paul Warren, Ellie's father, decided to start an investigation of his own to solve the case. He traveled to Mozambique with a team of private detectives and made several visits to the place where his daughter lost her life. Paul claimed to be quite determined to find out once and for all what had happened to Ellie and ended up making revealing and harrowing discoveries. The team began its investigation by questioning people who lived and worked near the beach about what they knew about the case. Poe talked to several people and begged for any information about what had happened. And after just one day of investigation, he had already managed to obtain more information than the police revealed in the two years of searching. They acquired a photo taken even before the police arrived, when the body was still on the beach. In this photo, you can see Emily with her face facing the sand. Her legs were parted, her underwear around her ankles and her shirt was ripped. Her body was covered in sand from her face to her legs and showed several signs of violence. From the image, it is possible to say that Ellie was most likely abused and then killed. There were several indications of a physical fight, which indicates that Ellie tried to defend herself. It was a terrible picture to look at, especially for the victim's own father. Paul started looking for even more information behind that photo. Through it, the whole theory of violent death became even more sustainable and discarded once and for all the idea of accident. He went after the people who actually saw the body for the first time, as the testimony of the fisherman who found her in the bathroom wasn't worth much, since that wasn't the place she had actually died, and Alice's dad and his team managed to find out even more. When contacting people who saw the body at the actual place of death, even before the photo was taken, it was reported that Ellie's body was in a position similar to that of someone who is praying, on her knees, with her face pressed to the floor. With the information obtained and the help of private detectives, Paul went to defend the hypothesis that the field police had put the body in another position and taken it to the public bathroom to mask what had been such a brutal crime. Their intentions would probably be to shield the truth about what happened, which, if made public, which caused some panic in the city and damaged the reputation of the country's authorities, causing economic damage to the place, especially in the area of tourism. Following the line of what was done by the field police, the investigative police would then have demanded very little effort in the solution and accurate investigation of the case, if any investigation was actually carried out. This is clear from the vague and incomplete reports and the rush to resolve the case, but the photo and the statements obtained by Paul proved the opposite of what the police claimed. All the details shown in the photo suggested that Ellie would have died a horrendous death, involving physical struggle and also possible abuse. In addition, a forensic examination proved that the sand that Ellie had sucked in was different from any sand found near the bathroom her body was in, which in itself was enough to overturn the police's allegations. After all these findings, Ellie's father declared that he was outraged not only for having lost his daughter so brutally, but for all the farce involved in the investigation of the case. It is very frustrating to know that whoever was supposed to protect your life is actually working on behalf of those who took it. For the young woman's parents, knowing that the person or the people responsible for the crime against Ali is on the loose, free and capable of making other victims, is the worst part of the whole drama they are experiencing. In Mozambique, her father built a kind of memorial 
at the place where the body was found, containing photos of Ellie as well as flowers and messages of affection from people who knew her. Her body was cremated and her ashes were scattered around Port Phillip Bay, Australia, with various tributes. Ellie's family continued to seek justice, also requesting the help of the Australian government to pressure the Mozambican police for better clarification. Nicole Caffarella, Ellie's mother, had been directly pressuring the Prime Minister for some political interference in Mozambique to investigate the case, or even for sending an Australian investigation team that can carry out a separate investigation. She even created a petition on Change.org asking Prime Minister Scott Morrison to help. In that petition, you can see the message. We ask Scott Morrison as Prime Minister of Australia to intervene in this case to put pressure on the government of Mozambique to allow Australia to provide an investigation team to work with the Mozambican police to resolve the matter, Ellie's case, and give her some justice. Just two weeks after being published, the petition had already garnered more than 36,000 signatures. The family is outraged by the continued lack of interest and transparency of the Mozambican police, even after two years of questioning. They almost never respond to requests for further clarification, and when they do send something, it's always superficial reports. Paul even offered a big reward to anyone who had information leading to the person responsible or the people responsible for his daughter's death. He also managed to do so the involvement of Interpol, the International Criminal Police Organization, which has been mobilizing efforts in the investigation of the case, dialoguing with the country's government about a better investigation of the crime. Despite all these efforts by Ellie's family, the investigation of the case was still slow. It was then that in 2020, four years after the crime, Nick Greger, a German private detective and bounty hunter, offered his services for free to Ellie's father. Nick is a former leader of the White Gang and was once considered one of the most dangerous men in Europe. Today, he uses his knowledge to catch criminals wherever they are. In an interview, he said, I have been trained to track wanted criminals, working with various groups in Africa, so I understand their movements. Nick has set up a covert operation under the codename Student. He initially worked on a chip that a South African woman gave Ali's father. This woman had a vacation on Tofu Beach in Mozambique, and through messages she sent to Ali's father on Facebook, she said she was warned by some local residents to stay away from a group of people who would be from a gang and were known for drugging and robbing tourists. The woman also said that the leader was a drug lord who had distinctive tattoos and frequented a bar near Branco's Pizzeria. With this information, Nick already knew where to start. He didn't go to Mozambique to investigate closely, because according to him, a white person would draw too much attention there and the operation would be put at risk. Instead, he decided to enlist the services of a local call girl to get her close to the leader of this gang who was the main suspect in the crime. He made the proposal to several girls through a job ad, offering a good amount of money, but they all refused, until with a little more insistence, one girl accepted. According to him, the girl who accepted the job already comes from an environment where criminals are not rare, and when he described the mission, she was not scared at all. She managed to get close to the suspect, and with each new discovery, she passed information on to Nick. After four weeks with the suspect, she managed to record a conversation with him, where he bragged about having robbed and killed a tourist who was probably Ellie. In the end, the girl had to walk away from the criminal as the situation was getting too dangerous for her, as he started saying things about taking the girl's life. But the recorded conversation was more than enough to prompt the authorities' full attention on the leader of this gang who was likely to be responsible for the crime. And that's exactly what happened. In the same year, Paul Warren, Ellie's father, received a call from the Australian Federal Police, telling him that they had traveled to Mozambique and started a wider investigation into Ellie's case and that the police from Mozambique was willing to help. After four years of persistence on the part of Ellie's family so that the case did not fall into oblivion, it seems that the case was finally getting due attention from the authorities that could have solved the crime. In total, Powori spent more than 50,000 on his own search for answers, minus the 25,000 he offered as a reward for information leading to the perpetrator. For Detective Nick Gregor, Ellie was the victim of a robbery gone wrong. He believes that the gang leader, along with one of his henchmen, tried to rob the young woman and because she resisted they killed her by pressing her against the sand so that she suffocated. After that, the young woman's body was transported about a hundred meters from the place of death, 
probably by local residents who did not want negative attention on the beach that would consequently hinder tourism. Those responsible for Ellie's death knew that the local police would cover up the truth and say that the cause of death was another in an attempt to protect the region's tourism. Now, with the intervention of the Australian Federal Police, it is possible that the person responsible for the crime against Ellie will finally be arrested and the cheerful, energetic young woman with a promising future will have her due justice. Well folks, that's it. Subscribe to the channel and keep an eye out as soon as there is new information about the case, I will bring it here for you. Thank you so much for watching until the end, best wishes and I'll see you next time.